Yes. Yeah, yeah. Please on your video, then we can start now. Yeah. So, uh, dear participant, good afternoon. Uh, today, afternoon, first session, we are going to start with Professor jo, uh, Joanne Pavi. Uh, Madam Joanne Pavi is a professor and head in Department of Psychology, very active member. Uh, she is also engaged in so many activities of the university as well as the outside in the uh, counseling and all. So, Madam, uh, welcome you in the fifth FIP program organized by HRTC Mizoram University. So uh, now uh, with this brief introduction, because Madam is our inside faculty, our own uh, professor in the Mizoram University. So, uh, Madam, welcome. And now I am handing over the session to you for your presentation, Madam. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Madam. You are okay. Audible. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege and a pleasure, as always, uh, to be part of the HRDC programs, and specifically for today's program, which is the faculty induction program. Uh, so I will begin my talk straight away. And at the end of the session, probably we will have 10, 15 minutes for discussion. As uh, Dr. Manoj has already said, uh, today we will be talking about mental health in the workplace. And uh, we all know that mental health is a very, very important uh, trending issue today. Everyone is talking about mental health. Everyone is talking about life satisfaction, well-being, mindfulness, et cetera, et cetera. All of us in this very, in this uh, 21st century, new millennia, there is a lot of stress and pressure, uh, tension in everyone's lives not just working people, but even peer students, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that this uh, presentation and this lecture, this talk will be useful to all of us. I will be talking about the basic concepts and also uh, at the end, I will be giving some tips uh, on how to improve uh, your mental health as a person, as an individual in your workplace. So let me straight away start sharing the slides. Sorry. Okay, is it visible? Yeah, madam. We, we so, good, madam. Yeah. So, uh, mental make health presentation, the... madam. If also yeah. make it presentation mode. Where is the presentation mode? Uh, uh, just a page F five. Yeah, F five. Madam, down one button is there. Uh, your left and right hand side down, where the percentage, no, before yeah. that, before that percentage, you click in that button. Uh, F5, I have pressed, but it's not working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, if you know, in uh, your right hand side down, uh, there is a one uh, button. Uh, yeah. We have 89 or 69 percentage written before that button. No, there is no 85 and 65 Six, in my Some laptop. percentage is written, madam, that viewpoint in bottom. Madam, oh. zoom control is there, no? zoom yeah. scroller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, that one. I yeah, yeah, just before that. Before that. Before that. Before, that. Be, not, not after. No, no, not after. But that just before before uh, uh, yeah, before that four hundred before hundred one right, yeah, yeah yeah this one. okay thank you not very savvy with the computer so excuse uh -huh. me now it's okay madam yeah yeah okay I'm stopping my <clears throat> uh, video and I'm starting the slideshow okay so mental health in the workplace.
Hello. Hi, yes, madam. Yeah. I think some technical problem was there. Okay. I just restart. Yes. Yeah. Now I need to go to here. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, to promote good mental health in the workplace. So we have a very streamlined, uh, very systematic, scientific, technical way of going about promoting mental health in the workplace. It's not just some anecdotal or observational study that has been for put forward. It's a very scientific uh, research study that has been done by under the ages of the WHO and they have come up with a work plan, action plan that can be implemented in different places of work, whether it's an institution, university, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the basic uh, tenets of the uh, this work plan, this action plan is to address the social determinants of mental health, such as living standards and working conditions. Uh, so living standards is something which is uh, in the hands of economists, but uh, it is in the hands of all of us, as well as mental health professionals, when we talk about the working conditions. Uh, the next line of action is activities for prevention and promotion of health and mental health, including activities to reduce stigmatization and discrimination. Uh, the last sentence, the last part of this sentence is very, very important because as of now, even in developed countries and uh, developing countries, there is a lot of stigma and discrimination for people who have mental ill health whether it is just a psychological distress, a minor psychological distress, or a major uh, mental health disease or disorder. So the WHO uh, action plan calls for activities for prevention and promotion of health and mental health. And the third action plan is increasing access to evidence-based care through health service development, including access to occupational health services. Uh, this is another very important aspect where uh, you can say that, as I said earlier, it's not just some uh, thing uh, that we have developed from folklore or anecdotal or observational uh, evidences. It is a scientifically based, evidence-based uh, system uh, module which has been developed by the WHO. And also, in addition to that, WHO has also produced Protecting Workers' Health Series. It is a, a module which has been developed by WHO to help employers, heads of institutions to uh, use or to provide as training modules so that the mental health of the workers in their institutions uh, and other organizations can use these to train their employees so that the employees will have better or good mental health. So starting from basics, mental health is an integral and essential component of health. We all know that mind, body, and soul are deeply interconnected. If an individual is physically unhealthy, then the mental health status of that individual is also affected, impacted, and vice versa. So as we all know, mental health is an essential, integral component of health. Overall, all round health, physical as well as mental. The definition of mental health by WHO is state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stressors of life and can work productively and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Here we're not just talking about a person who is uh, very much an expert in just a field, whether it is studies, any job, or any other area. But overall, state of well-being in which the individual realizes his her abilities, has, has confidence, self-esteem, is able to understand himself, herself, be self-aware in a nutshell, and can cope with normal stressors of life. All of us, if uh, I ask any one of you, or all of you for that matter, please raise your hands. Anyone in this 
class who has never met any stress or who has never faced any stress in your life. I'm sure that none of us will raise our hands. All of us faces stress now and then uh, in our lives. Stress by itself or stress is very positive, is very healthy. If there was no stress, we would just be lying around doing nothing. Stress is a motivator to activate us, to energize us. So it is good. What the stress that we're talking about here is the bad stress. The stress that impacts our physical as well as mental health. Excessive, extreme forms of stress and tension in our lives. So all of us are born with the ability to cope with, to face normal stresses of life. We don't say if we meet or if we face a stress in our lives, uh, we tend to look for coping strategies that all of us have. Some of us have positive coping strategies. Some of us do have less positive coping strategies. And some of us have very negative coping strategies. Whatever it may be, all of us have that cap capacity and ability to cope with stressors, stress in our lives. And also, the definition also includes work productively and is able to make contribution to his her community. This is a very important aspect that many people, many of us, including myself, tend to put aside. It's not just me, me, me. It's you and us. What we can do, what we can share, what we can give, our expertise, our knowledge, our experience to other people around us. So overall, mental health is state of well-being in which an individual for himself is able to cope, work productively, productively and make contribution to his her community. So mental health. So basically at the core, what is the definition of mental health? Mental health is about how we think, feel and behave. All of us are thinking people, all of us are feeling people and all of us behave what we think and we feel, act out through our behaviors, through our actions, how we think, what we think, how we feel, what we feel. Uh, coming to the next slide, anxiety and depression are very common and very uh, used uh, by most people today. All of us, I'm sure, we don't have to go into the definitions of what anxiety and depression are. They are the most, one of some of the, two of the most common mental health problems. And they often rea are reaction to difficult la life event such as bereavement, but it can also be caused by work-related issues. That's why we come to the point of our talk today. Life events. It may be natural disasters. It may be many other kinds of uh, difficult life events. But one of the most important uh, areas where anxiety and depression are also common are caused by work-related issues the environment in the workplace. Uh, so I'm going back to basics. So what is mental health in the workplace? I know all of us are aware of this, uh, but I'm just going to uh, repeat them. Uh, literature review in 2003 found the following key work factors to be associated with mental ill health, health, health right? So mental health, mental ill health. Right? Uh, and the key work factors in the workplace, the mental ill health factors which are associated with uh, <clears throat> mental ill health in the workplace are long working hours, work overload and pressure, lack of control, lack of participation in decision making, poor social support, and unclear management and workforce. I would just like to not very uh, much in detail, but just give you examples. Long working hours, I don't think we need uh, examples specifically for this, but one example that I would give uh, with regards to university institution uh, scenario. Uh, like for example, in the science and in the other uh, life science departments where you have uh, research that has to be conducted uh, et cetera, et cetera. Even though research is done in all the other departments also, we don't have to work in 24 seven, day in and day out, 
right? But in the lab situation and other uh, streams, areas where it is necessary to have long working hours, it's not a nine to uh, five job. You cannot stop in the middle of an experiment, right? So uh, th those can be one of the factors, work factors. And also with regards to uh, meeting deadlines, you have to, this has to be finished by today. The uh, instruction is given in the uh, evening and it has to be finished that same day. So we all know what that means, long working hours. And if a person wants to keep his, her job, then they have to follow the dictates of the employers. Work overload and pressure. Time uh, deadlines, time limits, etc., etc. Lack of control. If we are an employee, not an employer, we all know that we are not in control of the situation, of the environment. And that creates a pressure and is also one of the key work factors. Lack of participation in decision making. Obviously, if you are the uh, VC, if you are the registrar, if you are the dean, you are the HOD of a department in our situation, in our environment, uh, we are, you may be able to be part of the decision making. But otherwise, if you are an assistant professor or a newly recruited uh, staff, uh, faculty in the institution, then uh, this is a very big factor and issue. You may have, be having a lot of ideas you may be having a lot of uh, solutions uh, to issues and uh, challenges in the department or in the institution. But since you are not able to participate at, in the decision-making uh, body, uh, that is a, a challenge. Then poor social support. Social support, when you talk about social support and talking about your family support, you're talking about the community support, but in the case of uh, the university or uh, an institution, then the social support here is the support you get from your colleagues at work, from the uh, non-teaching staff, et cetera, et cetera. Then unclear management and workload. This again is a very important challenge which is faced by many institutions also. Like for example, as a faculty, as a staff in, at a university, we do have uh, specific workloads, uh, but then, uh, in many departments or in many uh, areas of work, they, this may not be very clear. And so you're not sure about what you're expected, what you're supposed to do, what is your actual uh, work role, et cetera, et cetera. As a faculty, we all are very clear about what we have to do. Uh, but there are many other things that has comes into the arena. So all these, those are factors that have been identified in this particular study. So what are the issues in the workplace? The issues that most people uh, face, I'm not talking specifically about the university uh, scenario, but I uh, will emphasize on the university with examples. Workplace issues that can also affect mental health include stigma and discrimination, demand, control and effort, reward relationships, job burnout, harassment, violence, bullying, and mobbing, and also problematic substance use. The E is missing here, sorry for that. So these are some of the other issues that can affect mental health, stigma and discrimination. Here we're talking about uh, being from uh, in the context of India, uh, not so much uh, Mizoram. Uh, we have uh, many instances where we can face stigma and discrimination, not because we have mental ill health per se, uh, but because of uh, many other factors. Then the demand control effort reward relationships. This another is a very important uh, challenge or issue in the workplace uh, where I scratch your back and you scratch mine kind of uh, situation and scenarios are often evident. Uh, reward, effort, reward relationships even though it's not supposed to be there. Uh, but uh, it is sometimes there and that's a challenge. Job burnout. When we talk about job burnout, you reach that certain point in life or in your work life uh, that you don't feel like doing anything at all. It's not a case of depression. It's not a case of anxiety. But 
you reach that point of uh, time at that particular time in your work life where you feel unable to do anything feel helpless don't feel motivated, feel fatigued, etc., etc. You may have uh, a few or several uh, mental and physical symptoms at this point of time. We'll not <clears throat> go into detail about this. If people are interested, then they can always uh, ask for Google, Mr. Google. Okay, the next is harassment, violence, bullying, and mobbing. Harassment, as we all know, at the university, uh, in the university, we have the faculty redressal cell, you have the internal complaints committee, and you have a few other cells. You have the university counseling cell and so on and so forth. So what are the uh, types, kinds of harassment? What are the types and kinds of violence? Is there bullying taking place? Here we are talking about ragging in the context of the university and mobbing. Then you also have problematic substance use, right? So here we're talking about different kinds of substances. It may be alcohol, it may be drugs, it may be prescription drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some other issues besides what we had already uh, shown in the earlier slide that can affect mental health. Stigma, discrimination, because of uh, your family background, because of your financial status, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, uh, so what, why are we talking about mental health today in the workplace? Because psychological effects that emerge as most prominent manifestations of people who are experiencing work-related stresses are depression, depression, anxiety, loss of concentration. And why is that important? Why are we talking about this? Because if there is low mental health or low mental ill health in the workplace, then productivity decreases, absenteeism increases, medical costs increases, and so on and so forth. And the working environment, the working culture of, a, of an institution, of the faculty, of the department, the relationship with the students, the students' mental health is also impacted, right? So by receiving proper mental health care or by being aware of mental health and mental ill health and how to help yourself, how to improve the situation, productivity increases, absenteeism decreases and total medical cost decreases at the end of the day. If you have job burnout, then physically and mentally you will need to keep on consulting doctors, medical, professionals, and that will increase the medical cost, right? For to yourself and also to the institution that you're working for. And also having a healthy workforce that shows up to work in a good frame of mind, ready to work benefits everyone, right? Just a smile there, a greeting here, a greeting there. Even though you may have uh, gotten up on the wrong side of the bed that morning, If that, you bring that frame of mind, that bad mood, that bad vibe to your workplace, then the whole working environment is somehow uh, becomes unhealthy, right? So if people are happy, if people enjoy working at a place, if people have good uh, working relationship with their colleagues, with the people in their workplace, then that's a healthy working environment and that really helps the individual as well as the institution or the university and it benefits everyone. Uh, human resource development, we all know that in management you talk a lot about hu uh, human resource development and human resources. And under the ages of the human resource development in management, mental health illnesses are classed as disabilities because they can seriously impact an employee's capacity to do a job they are well capable of carrying out. If a person, if an individual has uh, mental ill health, then he, she is not per able to perform uh, to the best of his, her abilities. And that seriously impacts the workplace as well as the 
work of that individual. As we had said in the earlier slide, I will not uh, again uh, repeat what was already pointed out in the 2003 study on how uh, mental ill health or mental health uh, is impacted in the workplace. Excessive burn workload may result in burnout, uh, exhaustion, et cetera, et cetera. Then what can an employer or an employee support mental health in the workplace? This is very, very important. When we talk about inclusiveness, we talk about uh, participatory, we talk about inclusiveness, we talk about being supportive, understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Since this is not a counseling class or a counseling relationship, uh, when we talk about inclusiveness, we're not talking about uh, being invited or go inviting people from your work to have dinner at your place every now and then. That's just not possible as all of us know. When we're talking about inclusiveness here, we're talking about involvement, giving uh, responsibilities or giving importance to everyone in the your workplace, in the place of work, be it a uh, beyond, be it uh, uh, any of the non-teaching staff, be it a colleague, be it someone who comes uh, and delivers your mail, et cetera, et cetera. So that inclusiveness do or has professionalism, what can be done and what cannot be done. But inclusiveness is very, very important. And within that inclusive work culture, you have ensuring that workplace norms support mental well-being, role modeling by leaders talking about their own mental health challenges, investing in trainings to equip all employees with tools to support each other. Here, uh, we have as the Red Ribbon Club, uh, I don't know whether people are aware that uh, most of the universities and colleges all over India do have uh, Red Ribbon Clubs to have uh, sports uh, club, uh, have uh, that club, this club, where employees, faculties, or uh, non-teaching staff, the university fraternity in our context uh, can uh, air out there, have fun, have time to go and enjoy themselves. So, and also where uh, trainings are available. Uh, at this point of time, uh, we have uh, not actually have any trainings as such, but then with regards to, say, for example, mental health and HIV AIDS, blood donation, all those have been uh, done at the university level, uh, though they are not specifically trainings per se, uh, but uh, we could be having this so that employees, fraternity people of Mizoram University, say, for example, could have some avenue to understand, to talk about, to have uh, awareness on mental health and mental ill health and how to cope, how to face, how to deal with them in their lives. Uh, so here again, uh, environments in the positively managing mental health underpins good employee management and benefits everyone. This is a fact. So what do we do so that we have a good working environment. We have good mental health in the workplace. Very easy, right? We have here a list of uh, seven, six, eight uh, bullet points. Very easy to say, to talk about it, to tell someone, to advise someone. Avoid morning stress. But how do you avoid morning stress? Is the million dollar question, so to say. Understand expectations. But what is the step one to 10 or step one to five on how to understand expectations? Avoid conflict. We all want to avoid conflict, right? But there are circumstances, situations where we have to deal with conflict. We have to face conflict. You cannot keep on avoiding running away, right? There has to be at some point of time where you can no longer run. Anyway, stay organized, be comfortable, forget multitasking, walk at lunch, contra control perfectionism. Very easy to give advice to someone. But let us today uh, try to think about this in our context, in each of your lives. 
are you a morning person or a night person if you are a night person then uh, probably you stay awake till 1 2 o'clock in the night and find it very difficult to uh, get up in the morning and you have to be at your workplace by take the first period take the first class at 10 o'clock if you are a night person and you're up till 1 2 in the night it will be difficult for you to get up at 7 or 8 if you get up at 8 you are somehow able if you and you are living in the say for example in the context of mizoram university you are uh, li staying in the campus so you don't have to commute just 10 minutes 5 minutes by car or two wheeler to your place of work so you're not so much stressed but you're li if you're living in town you have to travel all the way 11 kilometers from the center of town to your workplace so you can imagine so morning stress in the context of getting up and going to your place of work so how are you going to avoid what are you going to do about it because if you are stressed in the morning then you come to the class or to your place of work within a very bad mood and that spoils the whole environment of your workplace your interaction your relationship with the people at your workplace also so how are you going to meet the challenge if you are a morning person you may not be facing this challenge because you go to bed early and you get up early so you have plenty of time to do things not rush 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 etc etc anyway so it's all uh, at the end of the day it's up to you and up to the person how to avoid morning stress understand expectations this needs a little bit of soul searching, so to say, uh, to be self-aware, to be more logical, to use our common sense more. All of us are born with common sense, but we tend to not use them uh, very uh, often. I'm leaving a question mark there, food for thought. Avoid conflict, stay organized. For a person who's been disorganized his her whole life, it's quite difficult. But understanding that you not being organized is causing you a lot of stress and tension in your work life, in your personal life, then you need to look for ways in which you can be more organized. These are all skills, abilities, that can be learned over time if you consciously do so be comfortable if you are a very uh, unflexible rigid person this is again quite difficult but it's something which can be learned how to be comfortable with yourself with other people forget multitasking if i ask a woman who's working uh, the husband also is also working and they have three children all in primary school. If the mother does not learn the skill or does not is not able to multitask, then she's not she will not be able to manage getting all the kids to school, getting herself ready for work, etc. etc. But multitasking taken to the extreme is not healthy at all. But depending on the situation and on the circumstance, this can also help out the woman in the example that I just gave, to be able to get through life, manage, walk at lunch, control perfectionism. We all are born with different personalities. Some of us are very uh, happy-go-lucky types. Some of us uh, like to uh, just take it easy, last-minute person kind of person, uh, people, etc., etc. Or someone who likes to have everything, all the pencils, all the pens in the room uh, ready for use any time that he, she wants to do so. Everything has to be perfect. So if you uh, look at yourself deeply, if you reflect and see that your perfectionism or your personality, your characteristic is towards perfectionism, you have to learn to be more flexible, less rigid, otherwise your life will be very stressed and tense and you will uh, be having a lot of uh, issues and challenges in life. Right? 
So the first, uh, there are 10 tips that I have highlighted here. I'm not going to uh, specifically go into detail uh, with each of them, uh, but I would like to uh, spend a little bit uh, time, more time on some of the psychological uh, aspects uh, of this. Uh, 10 tips, 10 clues to uh, good mental health. The first is talking about your feelings. This is very, very difficult, as we all know. And being a teacher or being a professor, a teacher in a school, a professor in the university or college, whatever, whatever work that you're doing, but specifically in our context as teachers, as faculty, uh, members of the faculty, this is particularly very, very difficult because in the traditional uh, scenario of uh, education, we're talking about the teacher-student uh, relationship, and we're still following the traditional way of education or uh, educating, where the teacher is the expert, the know-all, and the students are the don't know anything. Uh, <coughs> Sorry about that. So how can you admit or how can we uh, express our feelings or our thoughts to our students? Do we need to? No, we don't need to. What we're talking about here is expressing our feelings with people that we work with, people who are our counterparts, right? You may not uh, disclose or want to divulge your feelings, your thoughts, feelings, emotions, why you ang uh, your anxiety, uh, what happened to you the day before a fight with your wife or your husband, etc., cetera, et cetera. Here we're not talking about going and talking to everyone that you meet about your thoughts and feelings. Here we're talking about just talking about your feelings, finding someone to talk about your feelings to, who is your counter counterpart, who you feel comfortable with, who you know will not go and uh, shout or tell every everyone uh, that, your what you have just shared. Who will keep your confident confidential? Who will confidentially keep what you have shared with that person? Right. Not talking about it makes you mentally unhealthy as you live your life. So who do you tell your feelings? Who do you share your feelings with? The next slide tells us. Identify someone you feel comfortable with and who will be supportive. If you don't feel able to talk about feelings at work, make sure that there's someone you can discuss work pressures with, partners, friends, families. All these are people who you trust, who you know will not uh, make fun of you, talk uh, about you behind your back, etc. Et right? But expressing, talking about your feelings is necessary for you to have good mental health. The next is keep active. The second tip is keep active. When we talk about uh, exercise, when we talk about keeping active, immediately in this uh, age, day and age, I should say rather, we think immediately of the gym. Who has the time to go to the gym every day or three days a week, etc., etc. But here we're not just talking about getting enrolled in a gym or going to the gym. We're talking about physical exercise as if you are a, a person uh, who loves walking or who not necessarily uh, love walking, but there are so many things that can keep you active. If you're not a sports person, obviously uh, you cannot say that I'm going to go start playing badminton. You don't know what a cock is, what a shuttle cock is, what a... Uh, badminton racket is, then that's not possible. But there are so many things, innovative, creative things to keep active. And regular exercise, regular does not mean that day in and day out or every day. It means maybe depending on your mood, depending on uh, how you feel about it, three days in a week, four days in a week, every day, morning and evening, that's up to the individual. But what we have, the point is here is that we have to exercise regularly so that it boosts our self-esteem, 
and helps our concentration, makes us sleep better, look and feel better. We all know this, right? So, and as I said earlier, that uh, exercising does not necessarily mean uh, engaging in a sports activity or going to the gym. So those of us who are not interested or who cannot do sports have an option of at least 30 minutes exercise, at least five days in a week. That's the option that a few of us may have. But we need to do this regularly so that we are able to concentrate, sleep well, look and feel better. And if you have all, and if you are able to concentrate, sleep well, and look and feel better, you obviously feel better about yourself. And then your self esteem rises. Watch what we eat. Food habits, dietary habits are different for different people, depending on uh, which part of the country we are from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those <clears throat> people who are, say, for example, people who are uh, from outside Mizoram, what we eat, what the Mizos eat, is probably not what you are used to. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to adapt, but you may need to adjust to certain uh, dishes here and there. But if you decide that you don't want to, and it's not just uh, your taste, or you don't want to, uh, you decide that you're going to cook your own food, the dishes that you prefer, that's well and fine. That's individual choice and decision. But what we're talking about here is Make sure that whether you eat miso food, you eat a South Indian, your preference is for North Indian, whatever it is, make sure that it is healthy, nutritious, etc., etc., And also that you eat at regular meals. Say, for example, many of us, we've, when we're so busy, we come to work, uh, skip breakfast because we don't want to be late for work. We come, we start our work, we work, and then we forget lunch. And at three o'clock, four o'clock in the evening, we realize that we have not eaten anything for breakfast and for lunch, and then uh, eat. That is not very healthy habit, as we all know. What you eat, when you eat, etc. regularly, nutritious food, also plenty of water. All of us know that, right? So, and planning for meal times at work, bringing food from home or choosing healthy options when buying food. You have the university canteen uh, in our context. So do you bring, you don't have time to make lunch in the morning because you got up late. You are a night person, not a morning person. And then you have to eat from the canteen. Choose what is healthy from the canteen. Or make your tiffin or make the food your lunch in the night so that you can do, don't have to stress yourself out in the morning preparing the food and coming late to work where you will be more stressed. We all know this, right? We do this. And who is uh, Professor Zoe Pari to tell me this? But then what I'm saying, what I'm sharing today is we need to again be aware, consciously try to make choices, decisions for a good, healthy life and for good mental health. So this has to do with drinking, okay? So drinking specifically is, uh, here we're talking about alcohol, but here we can also include uh, addiction or dependence on other substances, drugs. And in many instances, there is a high range or a high degree of uh, addiction to prescription drugs, especially among uh, older people. Anyway, so alcohol, giving Dutch courage, and especially uh, the trend is there in the metros, even in India, as we all know, that we uh, drink on the weekends and we drink after work to make us comfortable, to make us uh, relaxed, etc., etc. But as we all know, if we start as recreational drinkers or users of whichever of the substance uh, that we are using. If may 
turn into an addiction where you are no longer in control of the substance that is being used. Then the next is relationships. So what, why do this relationship important? Relationships are key to our mental health. We talked about uh, drinking, we talked about exercise, we talked about food. Those are very, very important uh, for good mental health. But one of the very most important aspects of uh, good mental health is relationships. Working in a supportive team is hugely important for our mental health at work. We don't always have a choice about who we work with. I'm sure some of us are smiling. Uh, and if we don't get on with managers, colleagues or clients, it can create tension. It may be that you need to practice more self-care at this times, but you may also need to address difficulties, right? So what do we do? You have been recruited in an institution uh, a university or college where you are not able to get along with your manager, with your colleagues, your clients, with the staff, etc. Et so what do you do about it? Do you leave your job? No, you can't leave your job because it's your livelihood, right? So what do you do about it? For you to get good, have good mental health, you need to practice self-care, and you may also need to address difficulties. So how are you going to address these difficulties? You need to develop the skills, the know-how, talk to people, so that Friday evenings, you dread coming to work on Monday, scenario will not be there for you. The weekend, your weekend is spoiled because you're dreading, you don't want to go to work on Monday, on a Friday evening, right? And as we all know, work politics is around everywhere, right? So how can, what can you do about it? Will you challenge, will you confront? Will you stop talking, stop working, etc. Et will that be beneficial for your mental health? So you need to think, you need to relate, you need to discuss if possible. It may not be possible in some instances, but at least try to talk about it with people. So that uh, work politics you cannot remove because it's your place of work. It's where you're earning a livelihood. So how will you go about it? You cannot keep avoiding it, right? So. It can be helpful to find a mentor or a small group of trusted colleagues with whom you can discuss feelings about work to sense check and help you work through challenges. You cannot do it alone, that's a fact. So what do you do? Here, we're not talking about backbiting, we're not talking about uh, talking about people, gossiping, et cetera, et cetera. Here we're talking about discussing in a very sen sensible, uh, useful, uh, emotionally, uh, fruitful way of how you can go about it. And this is possible, let me tell you. And also here, uh, we are also talking not just about the work environment, but also uh, with regards to uh, your friendships and family environment. Many of us are so uh, workaholics, that we find it, we have no time for family, we have no time for friends. And at the end of the day, you look around after your retirement or even before your retirement, say for example, for young people like you, uh, you're going to get married and you need friends, right? You need relatives who will support, who will be there uh, to give you support at a wedding or even uh, other uh, situations. You have been so busy with your work, no time for anyone except for your work and yourself. And you find that you don't have any, you may have a thousand Facebook friends, but in reality, in real life, you find that you look around and there's no one that you can call a friend. So you need to balance. You need to work life balance. 
it's not just about all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, right? So you work, you play, but there has to be a balance. And also there are many negative uh, impacts or negative effects where if you have no relationship with people around you, be it your workplace colleagues, be it your friends in your community, be it your family, that may lead to loneliness and loneliness leads to many bad habits. Food habits, bad habits like smoking, obesity, etc., cetera, et cetera, right? substance use. The next is, uh, we all have to know, have all have to look deeply, reflect, none, that none of us are superhuman. We cannot be right all the time. We cannot be wrong all the time. We cannot be strong all the time. We all sometimes get tired or well overwhelmed by how we feel or when things don't go according to plan. There are times when we are happy, enthusiastic, energized, etc. Et so there are ups and downs in our lives. We have to realize that this, that's what life is all about. I'm not trying to be philosophical at this point, but we're talking about all these because these are very, very important ways or realizations reflection points we need to think about to have good mental health. We need to accept ourselves for who we are, what we are, what our capacities, abilities are in life. So the next is uh, making time for yourself. This is something which many of us uh, as budding uh, recruits in a new job or as a senior person, et cetera, et cetera. We tend to not do this. We tend to not think about ourselves. I'm not talking about selfishness, me, 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 me only kind of uh, situation. I'm talking about giving yourself time to enjoy life, to do things that you enjoy doing. Just take that five minutes pause, listen to music, engage in a hobby, talk to people, go for a walk, etc., etc. Go for a movie also, watch a movie. And also uh, plan. Uh, say, for example, people from in the context of Mizoram University, uh, staff, faculty who are from outside of Mizoram, look forward to the uh, semester breaks, to the uh, winter vacations, etc., etc the puja holidays, right? So you need to plan for this and planning uh, for holidays, planning for activities, takes your mind off uh, the stress, the tension, the burnout situation that you may be putting yourself in at that particular point. In time. So you need to, it's not about being selfish. It's not about being, just thinking about your enjoyment or your life, but to have, to be mentally healthy person, you need to, have fun, you need to be able to think about having fun, not being guilty or uh, blaming yourself that you want to have fun. We are all entitled to do, to do that. And we are allowed to do that. Always remember that, right? Oh, if I don't work, my family will not have food to eat. That may be a situation. But even in that situation, you still need to take a break, right? You cannot work 24 seven every day of your life. Otherwise you will have burnout, you will be stressed. And at the end of the day, you may need to be hospitalized for physical and mental issues and challenges. Also how learned how to relax, how to be more flexible is what we're talking about here, right? Sleep, listen to your body, mindfulness, yoga, right? Relaxation ex exercises, hobbies, 
exercises, etc., etc. Those are some of the ways that you can help yourself be a better person, have a more mentally healthy body, mind, and outlook, mindset on life in general. Right? Number eight is do something you're good at, right? I'm sure that all of us have something or many things for that matter that we are good at. Some of us may think, if I ask uh, each and every one of you, what are you good at? You may put on your thinking cap and say, oh, I don't think I have anything that I'm good at. But be assured, all of us have something that we are good at. We may not be good in studies, but we are good in sports. We can sing. We have good skin if we go into that area. Good looking. Very good communication skills. Have a lot of friends. Have green fingers. Can dance well, etc., etc. So you need to acknowledge yourself and try to find out what you are good at, what you love doing, and give yourself time to for that so that you can have fun. It's not just about fun, 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 right? You have to work and balance. Life, work, balance. Accepting who you are. One of the very big challenges that families face today is I'll just give you one short example. Uh, a neighbor's son is always getting first position in the class. Uh, and the family that I'm talking about, the example that I'm giving you, the whole family, that family, the neighbor's family are very uh, bright, intelligent family through generations. But the fam this family, there's never been a top 10 uh, scorer in the family for generations that they can uh, remember. But the parents are ambitious and they want the, their son, daughter to perform, to be in the top 10, to come first in the class, right? That's the scenario in many, many areas, in many, many families. And that causes a lot of stress and tension, uh, bad parenting, bad uh, parents-child relationship, bad relationship, dysfunctional families, substance use in the parents and the children, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to remember that we are all different. We have our strengths, we have our challenges. We are good at something and not good at, not too good at other things, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to accept ourselves. Here again, I'm reiterating that I'm not trying to be philosophical, but to have good mental health, these are some of the steps, very important areas that we need to reflect on, think about, be more aware of, right? Being proud of who we are. I may not be on the same level or uh, my uh, colleague has uh, become an associate professor and I'm still an assistant professor even though we passed out in the same year, right? Of, obviously, of course, that is a subject of contention. It may make you feel uh, less uh, sure about yourself, not very confident, but you are good in sports. You have good communication skills where well, this other person does not have those skills. So that doesn't make your salary uh, as high as the your friend who is become an associate professor. But still, if you are proud of who you are, if you are aware of what you are, you can still be happy. You can still have good mental health and strive to be, have the necessary qualifications, work harder so that you are able to reach, you are able to achieve.
working for others. This is what we talked about in the WHO definition of mental health, right? Doing something, giving back to the community, caring for others. We tend to just care about ourselves, our families, our relatives, people around us, right? But we need to go beyond that to have that mental health. It's not just about me, 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 me. In the Eastern societies, we talk about collectivistic culture, collectivism, where it's all about families, it's all about communities, and so on, right? In the West, you have the individualistic culture. It's all me, 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 right? So since we are already have the already belong to a collectivist culture. We need to start looking back to our roots. We need to start thinking about what can I do? It's not about being a goody two shoes, doing good here and there, everywhere around. All of us are not capable and do not have the skills or do not feel the need. But in our small little ways, we can do things here and there, I'm sure. And that makes us feel good. That makes us feel mentally healthy and feel good about ourselves. Be it your colleagues, be it your, the staff that you're working with, be it your family, your neighbor, etc., cetera, et cetera, right? So what can you do? It's not just about volunteering because and you don't have time to do that, but you want to. You can make time if you want to. Take that extra step, walk that extra mile. Okay. And also at the end of the day, helping makes us feel needed and valued. And that boosts our self-esteem. So it's all for us only that we're doing this. If you help, if people, uh, if you help people, if you feel needed by people, then that boosts your self-esteem. So it comes, it bounces back to you at the end of the day, right? Anyway, so what does the law say about mental health? A wide range of legal rights that protect our mental health at work. This range from basic human rights, such as the right to freedom of expression and freedom of association, to the health and safety legislation that keeps us safe from hazards, including psychological hazards. We know there are a lot of laws, rules, regulations, even within the university uh, it's not just under the constitution, the Indian constitution, the right to freedom of expression, right to this, right to that. Even as I said earlier, even at the university arena, we have the internal complaints committee, we have the uh, faculty redressal, we have the counseling cell, etc., etc. that looks into the uh, rights, that looks into the legal aspects of mental health. Do not go to delve too deeply. It would take a whole day's lecture just to talk about the legal rights. Anyway, we have to be aware of this aspect. So this is awareness of mental health is increasing. So they are in the last few slides. So I think we still will have time, maybe five minutes, okay? Uh, so it's increasing, but still there is a lot of stigma, discrimination uh, about mental health and very less awareness. So all of us have to be aware that it is not shameful. It is not uh, something that you have to hide underneath the blanket if you're not feeling well. If you feel you need to talk to someone, uh, share with someone, talk about your feelings. It's very much acceptable, socially acceptable today. Even though in some instances, it may still you may still feel stigmatized, discriminated because of your uh, problems that you may have psychological distress, it may be anxiety, it may be depression. Feel free, feel comfortable. There are professionals everywhere that you can ask for help from. If you don't, if we don't reach out, then we are the ones who will be having a problem, right? So uh, even though in spite of the stigma and the discrimination, so many issues and challenges are there with regards to mental health issues and challenges, right? But feel comfortable. The 10 tips that I shared just now that I uh, shared with all of you right now, 
is something that you can do at your level. You can do by yourself. It's your choice, it's your decision. But remember that there are mental health professionals around you and it's not embarrassing, it's not a shame, it's not uh, something that you need to feel guilty about to ask for help. Okay, thank you very much. I think I've passed time. And uh, do we have uh, five minutes, uh, Professor Bartendu? Professor Manoj, are you there? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Do we have time for questions or? Uh, uh, so far, no one has given any question. Okay. Uh, and participants, if any question is there, just put it so that ma'am may answer. Yeah. I don't know anything, okay? So don't ask too complicated questions. <laughs> <laughs> you are expert on the subject, madam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, participants, anything? All appreciative words only are there, so madam, no question. Okay, fine. So, okay, anyway, then let's... we already taken more than the time. So, is yeah, okay? yeah, I know, I know. Sorry for uh, no, it's still time I... is there, ma'am. It's still time is there. Time is not short. Yeah, I if you want to... uh, some point, you can explain because it's still time is there. Ten, no. ten minutes more, you can take, ma'am. No, if there are no questions, I think people are feeling sleepy. Okay, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, let's do one exercise, even though you all can see me, but I cannot see you. Uh, let's all put our hands up and do this. Yeah. Left. With you. Right, yes, with me, right. Left, right, okay. And if people want to, they can jump. I don't know if there is a, a, another class after this. Yeah, one class is there. Okay, good. So all of you, please raise from your chair. Stand up from wherever you're sitting. All of you, all of us. Okay, we'll jump two times. One, two. Okay, thank you. So that will make you feel less sleepy for the next class. Okay, thank you very much for your okay. attention. I hope it was, uh, it will be help you even in a small way uh, in how you look at and how you live, live your lives in your workplace. With, okay, good mental okay, health you, to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. Nice presentation. Uh, thanks. You may stop your uh, screen okay. here. Oh. oh, yes, yes, now it's fine.